Do you load into a typical cruiser match with a sinking feeling like you're already dead? And does it bum you out that cruisers don't have the concealment of a destroyer, the armor of a battleship, or the devastating strike power of either of those types of ship? It's true that cruiser life can be difficult and frustrating for the average World of Warships player. In the right hands, however, a cruiser like Baltimore can be flexible, amazing, and insanely fun. But there's no way it can survive this point-blank encounter against a battleship and a cruiser and come out on top, right? Think again. Van Kraken here. I am a proud and successful cruiser main, and in this episode of World of Warships Legends Shots, I will demonstrate the power of one key technique that can turn your typical dreaded cruiser game on its head by making you an elusive and deadly force to be reckoned with. Alright, let's kill the suspense and reveal that the game-changing technique we're talking about is kiting, which could be defined as moving away from an enemy ship while we're angling, actively maneuvering, and firing our guns. Now, if you're observing a typical game in which a war spite were chasing after a fragile de Grasse, you might assume the battleship automatically has the upper hand. But what if the cruiser captain had intent in that chase, was actually leading the enemy battleship on a string like a child running with a kite? So let's set this straight from the get-go that kiting is not simply running away. It's an active strategy that extends the survival of your ship and keeps your guns hot and firing. It's also a highly versatile skill as it can be used on virtually any map with open space or channels to navigate. It can be combined with other skills like going dark or strategically breaking detection, or even used by other classes of ships like destroyers or battleships situationally. And lastly, kiting can be used in any phase of a match. It can secure an early cap, it can win a 1v1 in the middle of a match, or it can help you bring home a victory late on the clock. Since seeing is believing, let's jump in and review three examples of live matches that illustrate the power of cruiser kiting as an awesome battle technique. In our first game, we find ourselves in the Brooklyn class light cruiser Boise, under the command of Norman Scott. Now his skills have been chosen to influence our rate of fire and fire chance and to give us the ability to see how many enemy ships are targeting us. Lastly, from a ship module perspective, we will go for things that increase mobility like propulsion and rudder shift modules. At the beginning of this game, we take a position to offer fire support at the DCAP. But unfortunately, our team proceeds to push blindly and individually, resulting in a loss of a destroyer, a cruiser, and a battleship, all within the first three and a half to four minutes. Now down three ships and hopelessly outnumbered on the east flank, our best result in this situation is to delay the push to the center of the map by the attacking team and try to perform an active retreat. As a three-quarter health Odin comes barreling around the corner of the island position we are vacating at only seven and a half kilometers away, you could rightfully assume that this engagement is pretty much over before it has a chance to get started. However, instead of laying down or YOLOing straight into the Odin, we decide to use the first of our kiting skills, which we will unofficially call wiggling. The goal of wiggling is to minimize the amount of damage we take in a single salvo from the pursuing battleship. We constantly alter our course laterally from side to side and occasionally throw in changes in speed as well. The result of which is to present the Odin and a Sharn horse that appears in the center of the map with a difficult and constantly changing firing solution that is mainly focused on the stern of our ship and not our sides. We keep wiggling, turning, and firing, and this engagement draws out for almost five minutes, in which we deal over 66,000 damage to the Odin while taking about 29,000 in return, setting eight fires, and ultimately killing the Odin against all odds. Our sense of victory is short-lived, however, as we are destroyed by enemy fire as our team completely melts. But what we've clearly yeah, illustrated in this first battle is that kiting is fighting. Uh -oh. It's not just running. We successfully prevented the premature death of our Boise, keeping our guns in the battle for as long as we possibly could by wiggling and actively maneuvering. We were also able to prolong the life of our teammates by drawing a significant amount of fire. 
obviously from the Odin who pursued us halfway across the bottom of the map, and also from the Sharn Horse who is camping in the center position. The last thing we accomplished was pulling that Odin out of position. We had him chase us like a rabbit out to the edge of the map where we could successfully deal with him and kill him one versus one. Now, if our team had been more organized, they might have been able to mount a comeback and defend C, but unfortunately, this particular group could not be saved. But what this first example of wiggling does show is how we can increase our overall damage in a match in a cruiser, how we can draw a ton of potential damage, and though not in this game, on average, increase our win rate as we become an overall better cruiser player and more effective teammate. And what you'll continue to see in our subsequent battles is that kiting is a technique for open water play. It's aggressive. It's playing right up in the face of even multiple enemy ships that you don't have to hide behind an island all match to have an impact in a cruiser. All right, onward to our second scenario, which is drawn from a match in the Helena. Helena is one of my favorite ships in World of Warships. She is a sister ship of the Boise and also a Brooklyn class light cruiser. Norman Scott is back at the helm. As we load in on Sleeping Giant, we take up one of our favorite support positions at the island behind the sea cap. After harassing a few ships back into cover from range with HE rounds, we have a chance to move in and take out an enemy Benson that decides to try to steal that cap. Oh, come on. We are able to push in under the cover of some important leftover smoke and finish off the enemy Benson. And in celebration Bye. of this important kill, we decide to dock at the beach for some well-earned shore leave. However, the Nagato trailing the Benson quickly breaks up the party as it decides to round the opposite island and press the issue. At this point, we are only 8 kilometers in closing from the BB, so we execute a turn, keeping our stern to the Nagato and making way at full throttle. At the start of this engagement with the Nagato, she is roughly the same short distance from us as the Odin was in the last game. But the big difference this time is that we have support. We use the number indicator next to our eyeball detected indicator and a visual check of the Nagato's guns to see if we can bring more serious firepower to bear in this game than the last. When we see that the pursuer is distracted and not targeting us directly, we make our wiggling turns as in the Odin match but take full advantage of swinging out our stern and bringing all 15 barrels to bear on our target when we can. In case the player thinks of refocusing on us, we start to time our shots, swinging out for the shot and back into a position where we can stay skinny when we are not firing. As a general rule of thumb, every time we turn out, we keep the thought of two shots for one in mind with most cruisers. In other words, we can swing out, take two shots, and tuck back in and make ourselves skinny showing little to no broadside and wiggling uh, while the battleship is reloading. After they fire, we rinse and repeat until the Nagato in this case is dead. We survive another really close encounter that takes almost three entire minutes in real time. From the point of getting the kill on the Benson, we dish out 37,000 damage from HE shells and four fires, while taking 30,000 damage in return and surviving to go on and help close out the match for a win. This example illustrates how valuable it can be to swing out and use all of our guns when we get a chance to, but we need to tuck back in and stay skinny to minimize broadside angles to our pursuer when they return fire. Using the stay skinny skill will help us increase our overall damage output, reduce the amount of damage we take in return, and increase our chance of winning close quarters engagements. Now that we've had a chance to review two matches and two different and very useful kiting skills, the time for the main event has arrived. We've been waiting since the intro of this video to see if our Tier 7 Baltimore, the namesake of her class and again under the command of Norman Scott, can survive a very difficult encounter on Haven. It's going to be a tall order, but we have wiggling and staying skinny on our side and just might have one more vital kiting trick up our sleeve. Over the course of the first half of this match, we do our level best to protect our team from a push on the west flank, a popular channel for capital ships to travel with open space for destroyers to roam and provide a screen. After successfully whittling down a Moss and dispatching a distracted broadside York for a kill, we set the stage for our last stand on the two line with about eight minutes to go in the match. At this point, it's a 4-3 game in our favor, but we only have the support of a distant Massachusetts sitting all the way back in our spawn. 
We push forward a bit to spot, and there she blows. Another nearly full health Nagato. Definitely coming to avenge your buddy's death from the last match. She is pushing in from the island dead ahead at 10 kilometers and is closing fast. And we only have a little more than half of our health pool left to deal with her. So we have to make a really quick decision about what to do next. Baltimore has really good armor for a heavy cruiser, but not good enough to stop the potent AP shells of Nagato's 16 inch guns. While she's not that accurate, even at close range, we decide that we can't win a bow tanking duel. So we blast off one last salvo of HE and wait for an opportune break in between the Nagato shots, accelerating to turn away 180 degrees and into a skinny kiting position. Okay, these odds feel a little better, but just at the point of executing our turn, we see that she has a friend. It's an are you freaking kidding me moment as we see a barely Nick Chapayev sliding into attack position across the Nagato's wake. This complicates things obviously, so we have to rattle off another really quick decision. We decide to change our ammo load to AP. We are going to prioritize killing the Chappie first while she is giving us a sweet and juicy broadside target. But how we position ourselves now during this more complicated kiting scenario is the key to whether we have time to fight back or whether we go down before we get swinging. While we start firing AP rounds to chip away at the Chapayev, we plot a course into the gray pass shown here, which is our safest choice. But why is that the case? Completing our turn and wiggling onto the shaded heading splits the angle between the two pursuing ships facing away from our stern, so that neither one of them has a clear shot at our flat side. We are able to continuously engage the Chappie and are essentially staying skinny to two enemies at once, wiggling constantly and giving no easy shots or free broadside targets. We still take major damage as we chip away with multiple salvos and then finally, yes! land another citadel hit and the killing blow on the cruiser. But yikes, we are down to only 3,800 health when we activate our last repair party. And now it's down to a 1v1 with the Nagato. So we start a turn to our port side to kite on a new perpendicular heading that allows us to start firing AP shells at her relatively soft side. The Nagato nearly misses us with a salvo as we wiggle and we are landing shots and about to get the kill when, wait! The valiant Massachusetts has left the cap and come to our rescue to steal, I mean secure the kill. We clutch the flank and survive a nail biter extraordinaire. The battle timer shows another engagement of just about three minutes in length. We take almost 28,000 damage over that short time but dish out a whopping 59,000 damage in return, including four citadels on the chappie that completely save our hide. All hail US Navy super heavy AP shells. We carry the flank, provide an easy kill for our Massachusetts, and best of all, we clinch the win for our team. So we hope we've convinced you that these are three vital kiting skills you can learn to become a completely different and more successful cruiser player. In our Boise match, we wiggle our way to victory in a five minute marathon war of attrition with a determined higher tier battleship Odin getting the kill in an arsonist medal, but unfortunately losing the match. In Helena, we alternate between swinging out for full firepower and staying skinny when taking fire to survive another close encounter with a distracted Nagato, securing a cap with a key destroyer kill that helps to lead the team to a win. And in this last amazing match in Baltimore, we literally put it all together. Deciding to turn away from the Nagato to get into a kiting position where we can both wiggle and stay skinny, and then plotting the right course when it counts to successfully split the angle between two enemy ships that allows us to not only survive a pretty amazing one versus two situation, but be deadly at the same time with one and three quarters kills in that vital three minutes. We beat the odds and it feels great. Tier 6 and 7 US Navy cruisers were in full display in this video, but you can kite in any cruiser line at varied distances depending on their armor, mobility, and guns. Oh, and torpedoes would have come in really handy to bail us out in all three matches that we had in today's video. And most other countries have access to them in their cruisers. So in this video, it really is kiting that takes center stage. 
In today's kiting adventure, we learn that the longer you live, the more impact that you will have in a match. Manage your damage by wiggling and staying skinny, even at point blank range, until you can burn a ship down, get support, or find cover. Frustrate your opponents. An actively kiting cruiser is one of the hardest targets to hit in the game after a destroyer. Some players will get so frustrated at shooting at you that they will give up and find an easier mark. And lastly, this whole time we kept our guns firing. Unless we need to duck behind cover or go dark and break detection, we are going to keep our guns hot and continue to build damage and kills. If you found this episode of Shots interesting, helpful, or both, and want to learn another key way to improve your cruiser play, check out our Shots episode number one on how to use and abuse island terrain to punch way above your weight in cruisers with high gun arcs and a rapid rate of fire. It would be awesome if you would put any comments you have on today's kiting video below or leave a thought on a future topic you'd like to see us address in World of Warships Legends. I sincerely thank you for watching this video and remind you to join us for a live stream here on YouTube or on Twitch, or to check out our growing library of game tips, guides, and other content here on our YouTube channel. Now go give the cruisers in your port some love and take them out into a match today. This is Van Kraken, and I am out.